Hey everybody, it's fiber fuel time. I am so excited to share this information with you guys. I'm gonna to be totally honest with you. This is um, take number three. I have tried this three days in a row. Um, and each time I just have more information that I think you guys really want to swallow in one um, in one setting. So um, here's take number number three. This is basically a summary of a summary of a summary of a summary. Uh, that's where we're at right now. Um, but the reality is this book was amazing. And um, you can see all the notes that I took. I found so many nuggets of wisdom and so much truth and um, I, I just, I want to share so much of it with you, but I also want to make sure it's tangible and accessible, um, in a way that you guys can, um, practically digest, get it? It's a pun. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to share as much as I can with you today, um, just basically tastes of all the different areas that he kind of covers. But I really encourage you guys, if you hear something that really, um, strikes a chord with you, I encourage you to dive in a little bit deeper. Follow Dr. Um, Will Bolshewitz, we're going to call him Dr. B, on um, social media. You can find him at the Gut Health MD, um, both on Instagram and Facebook. Um, so he's got tons of great stuff that he's posted. I've shared a bunch on the group with you guys, but um, I'm so excited. We're going to dive straight in um, because there's just too much goodness and I want to condense it as best as I can. All right. So this book is going to speak to how we can heal what we've damaged and then set up healthy habits that will have a great impact on our health over time. The book's divided into three parts. There's background information, there's practical, um, what do I eat and how and why, and then the third uh, section is kind of a lifestyle. So it's an overview of different areas of our lifestyle um, that we may wanna adjust to be healthier on our guts. Um, and at the very end, he does share four week, um, four week meal plan. Uh, if you're really interested in, in applying all that he has um, recommended. Um, you can dive into that and it's got breakfast, lunch, and dinner for four straight weeks. It's um, co-written with a registered dietitian and culinary um, chef. So there are some really great um, recipes in there. I've, I've tried several of them. This, the sauerkraut is actually currently fermenting. We're on week three and a half. Um, I tasted it last night and I'm really excited about it. It just kind of tastes pickled, but um, that's my first foray into um, fermenting. So, um, all right, so let's talk real quick. Um, I certainly always want to preface that you need to make sure you talk with a physician, uh, primary care um, provider, before you make any drastic changes to your diets. Um, if you don't have a primary care provider, that is the number one takeaway I want you to get from my conversation with you today. Primary care doctors, um, physicians, or nurse practitioners, or physician's assistants are fabulous resources. You wanna make sure that you're seeing them regularly and that you can develop a good baseline for your health. Um, you don't wanna just see them when you're sick. So make sure you find someone. And if you find someone you don't feel like that it's fitting right with your um, personality or your, I don't know, if, if it just isn't the right relationship, then look again. It's okay to search for more. I really encourage you to look around, um, ask people who you know and trust, who they see and if they like them. Um, usually you'll find people who are regularly referred to. So both Michael and I use the same physician. Um, and then our kids, pediatrician, they have been phenomenal partners with us in our health journeys. Um, I've given both of them ample opportunity to correct me if I am doing anything that they feel is not safe for our family in terms of our diets. Um, and I've actually been so thrilled at how often, especially our pediatrician, I'll bring something that I feel is new to the table and say, hey, I was looking into this. Most recently, it was actually food allergies. Uh, I was looking into this. Is this something we need to be concerned about? And I've been so excited that he's just recently gone to a convention um, or a conference on that very topic. So he is with it. He stays up to date. He's got four young kids and he's still going to these conventions. Um, that's the kind of provider that I want to be partnered with. So um, I encourage you to dive in and find a primary care um, provider in your area. The other thing about primary care for providers, and that kind of segues us right into section one of the book, um, is that the reality is that most providers are operating on data that is at least 17 years old. 
Um, and, and what we learn right off the bat in this book is that gut health was basically formed in 2006. It's brand new to the world. And everything that we were learning, some stuff has changed because there's new information rolling out just constantly, annually at this point. So it's not even 17 years old yet. So most of the information that we now know about gut health has not made its way into primary care providers' um, practices. So that's why you really wanna make sure that you are bringing um, your own research to the table and, and let your physician kind of chew on it. And, and maybe they don't know the answers right away, but take what you've learned and say, hey, here's what I read, here's what I've learned, what are your thoughts on this? And let them um, dive into some of their resources and give you their um, professional opinion in that way. But the reality is since most of this stuff is new, you know, it takes 17 years for findings to go from publication to being in those practices. As I said, most physicians aren't really well versed in this um, area of gut health and they're operating potentially off early information that may have um, changed or evolved because again, we are learning so much so quickly. So what we knew before was you know, antibiotics caused issues, right? We, we thought antibiotics were the end all be all, the cure for all of our modern diseases, and they were wonderful for certain things, um, but they brought a whole host of new issues to the table. Um, so we're talking after, after we started, you know, sanitizing everything with Lysol, we started using herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, and then cancer and heart disease skyrocketed across our nation. So let's talk about um, some of the dietary issues that we've also started experiencing. One that comes up quite a bit is called TMAO. It's a chemical compound and it's gonna be the villain of this book. Um, so TMAO is ingested through animal protein, specifically found in red meat, liver, egg yolk, and dairy. So Dr. B touches on fad diets to some extent. He, he mentioned specifically the paleo, the ketogenic or carnivore diets. Um, and he specifically brings those up because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of energy toward them because of the weight loss results that people are seeing. Um, but his concern is that people are seeing exter external results, um, but not accounting for or weighing in the internal damage that may be um, associated with some of these diets. Specifically, the paleo diet. Um, they've seen a drastically um, higher TMAO levels with people who are on that diet because of um, the red meats in that diet. Um, and we'll dive a little deeper into this in just a minute, but um, the elimination of whole grains was one of the main factors responsible for in increased TMAO in folks who are using the paleo diet. Um, for the ketogenic or carnivore diet, um, the biggest issue was the use of meats, eggs, and cheeses, um, extremely low carb and high fat. Uh, which basically increases TME, TMAO. And what we'll learn in just a minute is whole grains are responsible um, in, in large part, very responsible for helping to keep that at bay. So diving into a, di a difficult diet that others have demonstrated to show weight loss is understandable. But remember, and this is a quote from Dr. B, you can look great on the outside and be rotting on the inside. So um, there's sometimes it's short-term pain or short-term short gain and long-term pain. So here's a magical formula that we're gonna use a couple times throughout this conversation. Um, I want you to remember this. this if, if you only take away two or three things from this, I want this to be one of them. Prebiotics plus probiotics equal postbiotics, okay? So we're mostly familiar with those probiotics, but let's talk a little bit about prebiotics. That's our food for healthy gut microbes. It comes from soluble fiber and resistant starches. So soluble fiber, we'll dive into a little bit. I'll give you some specific um, foods that you can use. Uh, resistant starch, you may not have realized was actually um, a prebiotic. So that's our oats, our rice, our potatoes, and our legumes. So again, that kind of covers a couple of those whole grain um, areas too. So we have our prebiotics. Now we have our probiotics. What are probiotics? They're microbes with beneficial qualities. Prebiotics are the food for the microbes. The microbes can't exist if they don't have their food. Okay, so it's important that you have a balance of both. If anything, you wanna promote the, the food because we already have probiotics in our system. So in order to maintain that balance, you need both of those things. Why? Because they together create postbiotics, which are compounds produced by our gut microbes. These 
are the healthy things that take care of all of our diseases. So here's an example. Here's one of those compounds, short chain fatty acids. C, uh, I'm sorry, SCFAs. You may be familiar with them. You may have come across them. If TMAO is the villain of our story, short chain fatty acids is the undeniable hero. So that is the gut hero. So short chain fatty acids are basically, um, there are three types. You will kind of probably hear of one more than the other, at least I have throughout my reading. Um, there's acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And I know I'm mispronouncing those. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but the butyrate is the one that I hear of pretty frequently. But they're all important. They work as a team in tandem. We need all of them to provide that proper balance for our health. So even beyond the gut, um, short-chain fatty acids have a huge impact on our immune system. Let's talk about it. It actually connects our gut to our immune system, this compound that we get, that postbiotics, um, short-chain fatty acids can connect our gut to our immune system. It can correct dysbiosis. If you're familiar with that, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Reverse bacterial endotoxin, this promotes inflammation. Um, it can fix leaky gut, optimize the immune system, provides great foundation for cancer prevention. So short-chain fatty acids are actually a cancer fighter. And it inhibits three of the most powerful infl inflammatory signals in the body. It can impact and improve Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis. There are so many things that short-chain fatty acids can do. It sounds like I'm just listing all of our top um, diseases and killers. It sounds like that. That's, that's why we call it the hero. Um, it really is the magical um, substance that we create in our gut that can help with all of those issues. Um, and here we go, obesity. I know that's an issue for a lot of you guys. Something you're really worried about is weight loss. So it can help lower our cholesterol and suppress fat accumulation. It helps us feel full longer. Um, and for those of you who have um, maybe parents or are struggling or have a family history of cognitive decline, um, there's actually some fabulous research and evidence that shows that short chain fatty acids, unlike other compounds, can actually cross the blood brain barrier. And so it impacts our cognition included. Um, so that means it has an impact on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Um, there are studies showing how it can help our school children um, in their cognition. So, you know, as your kids are heading out the door for school before a big day, big test, make sure they're getting a high fiber diet um, with the probiotics that they need in order to, to fuel their bodies and to create those short chain fatty acids for their cognition. Listen, we learned you know, that genetics are only responsible for 20% of disease. I think you guys may be familiar with that. And you may have even heard the um, metaphor that if genetics, um, if genetics or genes load the gun, then lifestyle pulls the trigger. And that's empowering. But I have to take it one step further. Dr. B tells us that short chain fatty acids are kind of the, the thing that can disarm the gun. So your genetics are only gonna set you up for about 20% likelihood of, of some of these diseases. Your lifestyle is really what's gonna make an impact and your lifestyle includes you know, your diet and your diet can actually disarm. And so when we're talking about the reversal of a lot of these diseases, heart disease, um, uh, cog cognitive decline, um, we have evidence to trace back um, and show that diet can impact that in, in such great ways. So short chain fatty acids can actually disarm the gun in that scenario. All right, so part two, here's the big takeaway from the book. Here's the other thing you, you absolutely need to walk away from this conversation knowing. The most important thing for our gut health, study showed the biggest gut study from the biggest gut doctor in the last 15 years said, the single greatest predictor of a healthy gut microbiome is the diversity of plants in the diet. All right, just the diversity of plants. So it's not enough to just be eating healthy foods at each meal. It's a diversity of those plants because each of these plants offer us such different things and they all fuel different things within our gut. All right, so let's talk about it. We're eating about one in 1500 plants on this planet. We're just, we're not eating much. Why? Because of the food production system. It's more efficient that way, right? But unfortunately, that means that our bodies are suffering because we're only getting certain things that can't, that can't help our bodies, fuel our bodies to fight um, some of these illnesses that we, that we are dealing with. 
The golden rule is both healing and preventative. What's best for your gut is best for your heart, your head, your skin. Um, and this is, this is the common denominator throughout all subspecialties that I've found. And this is really what has me continually confident that a whole food plant-based diet is really the way to go, is, is, is the answer to optimal health. Um, when the neuro guys and the heart guys and the skin guys and the everybody's saying the same thing, um, you really can feel confident that maybe there's one or two areas where they disagree, um, but there's a huge common denominator and that is plants and lots of them. Um, so what does that look like? Eat colorful, fresh, local, in season, raw or cooked. Um, both provide totally different things. So it's important to get some raw and some cooked in your, in your diet. Whole grains, we're gonna dive in a little bit more deeply. All right, whole grains are totally different from refined grains like sugar. Um, there were two big studies, the nurse's health study and the health professional's follow-up study. Um, these are two of the largest investigations into risk factors for major chronic diseases. And what they found was every daily serving of whole grains reduced the risk of death by 5%. But to take that a step farther, it reduced the risk of cardio death or death by a cardio event by 9%. So they're just looking retrospectively at these, um, these uh, patients, these people, um, participants in these studies, and they found that for every additional serving of whole, whole foods, whole grains, I'm sorry, um, that there was a reduced risk of death. So make, make the switch from, from whole grains um, two whole grains from white bread, white foods, starches. Um, so if that's something else you can take away from today. If you're doing white rice, switch to brown rice. If you're doing um, white bread, switch to um, whole grain bread. Look for the word whole. You don't just want to say wheat. It wants You want to say whole wheat or whole grain. All right, increase your short chain fatty acids when you make that switch. And in doing that, you're decreasing your inflammation and you're improving your immune system. All right, so we're gonna take that a step further. Gluten's a hot topic right now. So what is gluten? It's the protein found in three whole grains, barley, wheat, and rye. A third of Americans are actively restricting gluten based on test tube studies, which um, were marketed that showed gluten causes leaky gut. But the reality is we've learned since then that removing gluten from um, patients that have leaky gut didn't actually improve their gut. So when they took that evidence and they transferred it to a um, human research study, the evidence of gluten causing inflammation, immune activation, or intestinal permeability just didn't exist. Um, and Dr. B talks a lot about the different types of studies that are done. Um, and there are many studies that are done with evidence from animals that um, just don't transition and don't transfer to humans. Some do, but in some situations it just doesn't. And this is an example of that. Um, so celiac disease, that um, set off, basically sets off an inflammatory cascade that may increase the risk of heart disease if gluten is consumed. So certainly if you have been diagnosed with celiac disease, you absolutely want to stay away from gluten. Um, he dives really deeply into food sensitivities and food allergies. We'll touch on that a little bit later. But his big push is only about 5% of us need to be restricting gluten actively. The rest of us really do need to get some in our diet because there's so many great things that are provided from it. Short chain fatty acids is one great example. All right, let's talk about legumes full of fiber. So our peas, our lentils, our pinto beans. Um, it can be hard to tolerate. I hear that a lot from some folks. It's like, how do you ramp up your bean intake without really hurting your gut? The benefits will make it worth it when you realize how good it is for your, um, for your system. So we actually have learned too that our guts are muscles. Um, I'll touch on this in just a minute, but we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, and he talks quite a bit about how you can train your gut just like you would train any other muscle. Um, start slow, he says, start slow, go low. Um, so in the four week meal plan that they have at the end of the book naturally takes you through that as well. So it'll start off slow and definitely make sure you're um, ramping things up as you go. Legumes can help with weight loss in a randomized controlled trial. Um, the participants who ate legumes in this trial, their measure of inflammation dropped by 40% and they lost more weight, even controlling for calories against the comparison group. Um, the one food from around the world that is shown to make people live longer in a major study, legumes, all right? So that's coming straight from our blue zones, our five areas of the world. 
Um, and the reality is legumes plus whole grains equal a complete protein. Um, so the people who are living longest in our world, there are five areas that we call the blue zones, and that is a common denominator for all, all five of them. We'll talk briefly about soy. He dives in a little bit more, um, but obviously this is another um, misconception. So people are concerned that it's going to affect our estrogen, um, but estrogen is completely different from phytoestrogen. It acts differently in our body. Phytoestrogen is what we get from soy products. Um, it's actually an isoflavin and it's one of the unique phytochemicals found in soybeans. Um, so the studies have found um, that it lowers cholesterol, strengthens bones, treats menopausal symptoms, lowers risk of um, coronary heart disease, reduces risk of colon, prostate, breast, ovarian cancers. Um, and he just recommends you eat whole food forms of it. So that's our tempeh, our tofu, edamame, miso, tamari, and soy milk. Um, and he recommends non-GMO and organic. So that's certainly something we've, we've adopted in my family. Um, now, that's not to say that we don't ever have the junk food soy, be soy dogs and soy burgers. Um, but, you know, that's just the reality of our world right now, that there are seasons when we need to dive into the, the deep freezer and pull out something quick. So, um, so there's a balance, certainly. And um, I'd love to never have any of those in my, in my kids' diets. But for now, we're using them in moderation. All right, let's see what else. And he just encourages model consumption after Asians. This is the thing I always go back to when um, folks are really concerned about soy. There are generations and generations of Asians who have been eating soy, um, and they have some of the lowest rates of breast and prostate cancer in the world. Um, so, you know, to, to think that it impacts our, um, our bodies in that way when there's evidence all over the place that it doesn't um, just gives me the confidence that it's okay to eat. We've been doing it for seven years and had no issues. I got four boys in my family. So, um, so for those with sensitive gut, again, just referencing, there's some great information for you about what that might look like, how to tolerate an increase in fiber. Um, but I really encourage you to dive deeper um, to be able to kind of identify specific individual needs that you may have. But to summarize, distress, I'm sorry, digestive distress does not mean foods are inflammatory, um, but rather it's usually a sign of gut damage. So often elimination can, can kind of give you short-term um, resolution, short-term relief, um, but it's actually damaging the body to remove um, entire food groups like that because, again, diversity of plants is really important for our body to get everything it needs. Treat your gut like a muscle. Train it through plant diversity. All plant foods need to be on the menu from time to time to maintain our gut fitness. Um, and your gut, and this is a quote from Dr. B, your gut is adaptable and it will adjust to your choices. So this is something, if you're really sensitive to something, work with your primary care doctor or a gastroenterologist to see if you can start incorporating it into your diet. Um, a note about constipation constipation, he does say, listen, do not attempt to ramp up your fiber intake if you are constipated. Um, it just won't work. So talk to your doctor and try to get that corrected first and then start implementing some of these um, fiber-fueled um, diet tips. All right, so let's talk a little bit about food allergy. The most common are milk, shellfish, fish, eggs, nuts, peanuts, wheat, and soy. Um, so Dr. Rec Dr. B recommends kind of going back to gluten. 90% of us should be consuming gluten, the exceptions being those with celiac disease, which is about 1%, a wheat allergy, about 0.4%. And then there's those with non-celiac gluten sensitivity that have extra intestinal symptoms. Um, so again, if you have any concern, work with a physician and make sure, like rule out any of those issues before you change your diet, um, including both adding it in and removing it completely. If you have no symptoms or reason to uh, suspect any of these things, you should be consuming gluten because, you know, as we said, it's a major healthy component to um, a diverse plant-based diet and um, short chain fatty acids, they're um, a great promoter of short chain fatty acids. Prebiotics. Um, really quickly, if you're familiar with FODMAPS, F-O-D-M-A-P-S, um, you may have heard that elimination of these things can help with inflammation. Um, that is sometimes true, but you need to be working with a doctor on that. They are meant to be temporarily eliminated and then slowly brought back into the diet. They aren't intended to be completely eliminated forever. Um, so definitely make sure you're talking with your and working with your provider on that. 
fermentation. All right, so uh, Louis Pasteur, we discovered microorganisms. He basically, he was watching, you know, grapes turn to wine and food um, like milk spoil. And he identified that there were microorganisms um, at work. So unfortunately, food preservation eliminated the need for fermentation, which was our old school, you know, method of preserving our food. But it works by destroying the bacteria and sterilizing destroys the plant microbiome and its health benefits. Most of our food today is not just sterilized, but it's crossbred with chemical preservatives to inhibit microbes. All right, that's what we're eating when we eat our prepackaged preserved food. Fermentation makes foods more healthy. That was a big takeaway for me. I need to ramp up my fermented foods. Um, the more acidic, the less inflammation. So vinegar has really helped and folks that have inflammation due to things like gluten actually can tolerate sourdough breads easier than white breads because of that fermentation process. Um, so here are some examples of some foods if you're not as familiar. Kimchi and sauerkraut, they're very similar. Um, I wish I got it out because I have this beautiful purple sauerkraut that I am snacking on. Um, and I just took his recipe in the book and it's very loosely like it's whatever seasonings you want. I did some dill and some garlic and um, and so I took some purple cabbage and um, I've been just throwing that in every so often to salads and different foods that I'm eating. So um, kimchi is basically just a, a different area of the world. It's, it's very similar to sauerkraut but it's usually spicier and I've made kimchi before. I'm, I take back that this was my first time into fermented food. I made kimchi before, but I made it way too spicy. And so I couldn't eat it when it came out. Um, I tried to eat it on some, um, on a homemade Reuben that I made and it was a little too spicy for me. So, um, and then there's natto and tempeh. They're very similar. They're both, um, boiled fermented soybeans, but I think the, the package that they come in basically is different. So tempeh is, um, kind of a hardened log. Um, and so that's what I use a lot. I've actually never seen natto in the store. Maybe I've just overlooked it. Um, but I, um, I steam it to help get rid of some of the bitterness of tempeh and then I will grill it um, and throw it in salads or crumble it to make um, tempeh tacos. Um, and then I know I've mentioned miso soups are fabulous um, ways to get some fermented fermentation in our systems as well. Um, Dr. B actually recommends occasionally just having miso tea or miso soup as a broth um, in the afternoon. Um, and it's a very salty flavor. I've noticed that too. Um, but it doesn't actually raise blood pressure. So if that's an issue for you, you really don't have to worry about that, whatever um, the, whatever is creating that salt um, content, the miso helps to prevent that. So, um, and then there's kombucha. He likes kombucha if you're switching from soda, um, but he doesn't really recommend that we just go all in on kombucha. He dilutes it personally, um, and he doesn't drink an entire bottle of it. I've, I am the same way. I actually can't. It's really... Um, I think it's the acidity that I can't quite tolerate too much of. I can sip on it and I like the flavor of it, um, but it's just, it's really powerful. Um, so if you're doing kombucha, just make sure you're limiting, limiting it a bit because it can erode the enamel on your teeth. It's so acidic. Um, so then he talks about supplementation um, and we're kind of rounding out here. So he talks about prebiotics. Remember our formula, prebiotics is the food for probiotics, the good microbes. The combination of those two things create compounds like short-chain fatty acids that help give us all of these um, health benefits, okay? So prebiotics can be supplemented just like postbiotics. He's actually a much bigger proponent of prebiotic supplementation, um, but you need to vary which ones you take because um, different prebiotics influence different probiotics. So you wanna make sure there's diversity even in that. So he actually takes um, a different one every single day of the week. Um, and then he talks about probiotics. He, he likes probiotics, but he says there's a lot more hype than science at this point. Um, you know, the activity, Activia commercials and all that stuff came in, and we really were still learning a lot about probiotics. At this point, we know that if you take a probiotic supplement, it will do something on the way down, but within two to five days, if you're not feeding that with prebiotics, then it's just going to pass right through you. Um, and so here was an issue and, and something I really um, took away from the book. After antibiotics, a lot of us have been trained to feed the gut, fuel the gut, especially with our kids, um, with probiotics. 
However, more recent research has actually found that that may um, inhibit our microbiome's ability to stabilize itself. So his recommendation is actually to focus more on the prebiotics, focus on the, getting diverse fiber in your diet um, and in your kid's diet, get them out in nature, um, let them play in the dirt and get those healthy microbes um, and then sleep and um, hydration. The, that's what he recommends after um, a round of antibiotics. Of course, he, he you know also says, make sure you're only taking antibiotics if you absolutely need to um, and try to avoid them at all costs. So um, if you have questions about probiotic or prebiotic supplementation, you can actually visit him at plantfedgut.com um, and he can help identify what pre or probiotic you may need. Um, and a really cool thing, he thinks um, the future of gut health, which sounds really cool, actually lies in physicians' ability to diagnose and to prescribe um, dietary and, and, and supplemental um, pre and probiotics to us based on our individual gut. So every gut's different, just like a fingerprint. Identif identical twins will have very similar gut microbiomes, but they won't be the same. Um, so he feels like that's what's going to happen in the future. There's actually a company that he just recommended or, or mentioned, at least on social media, called Zoe, that's kind of starting this process. I tried to look into it to see if I could give you guys um, kind of some heads up on this company, but unfortunately, being pregnant, you're not allowed to do it. So um, something to look into. It's called Zoe. You can look them up on social media. All right, so his priority list, just to recap. First and most important is diversity of plants. The more plants you're getting in and the more meals, you'll crowd out the bad stuff if you're focusing on putting in all the good plants that you can. Um, so forget thinking about what you should and shouldn't have. If you just make sure your diet is colorful and you have a wide variety of plants that are local, in season, both raw and cooked, um, then you'll really be trying, you'll, you'll be turning the dial on your health in that way. And then second would be prebiotics. So that fiber full, soluble fiber, resistant starch foods to help ramp up our post, I'm sorry, probiotics ability to create the postbiotic compounds that help us with our health. Lastly, all right, here we go. F goals. That's what I want you to remember. F G-O-A-L-S, F goals. F stands for fruit and fermented. So one takeaway, berries. I've heard from neuro, heart, cardio, um, uh, microbiome, all the guys, they say greens, beans, and berries. Those are the most important things that we can be getting in our diets. He recommends the tiny little wild blueberries, and I like to buy those um, frozen. My kids love frozen blueberries for dessert. Um, but I also put them in cereals or oatmeals, or I make jelly out of them. Um, and I'll do a, a video on that someday. All right, the G stands for greens and grains. I'm not going to spend too much time because greens, we all kind of know a little bit about. Grains, we've already dived in, uh, uh, talked about quite a bit. Um, but there's an a index called the ANDI, A-N-D-I, Aggregate Nutrient Density Index. Basically measures foods for its nutritional value. And as you can imagine, um, sodas and chips and junk food falls at the very bottom of that score, whereas greens are kale, wintercress, our watercress, Swiss chard, collards, um, all of our greens are at the very top of that list. We can't totally make up our diet on greens. We need all of these things, um, all of these diverse plants in order to make a healthy gut microbiome. Um, but that's definitely something we all need to be ramping up in our diets. The O stands for omega-3 super seeds. I've talked about these a lot too. All three of these are in my cabinet at all times. So the first one is flax seeds, chia seeds, and then hemp seeds or hemp hearts. Um, so flax is rich in linens, which protect against hormonal cancer like breast and prostate. So again, if your genetic history is um, leaning you to, down that road, um, ramp up your flaxseed um, use. Um, all, uh, I'm sorry, flax and chia are also make really good egg replacements in baking. Um, and I can talk to you more about that too. Chia is high in omega-3s and fiber. And then hemp is actually a complete protein. Has a little less fiber and a little less omega-3, but it's got great protein. So we rotate all of those through. Flax and chia, I alternate um, putting on my cereal every morning. And then hemp, we put on salads, we put on pasta, we put on avocado toast. We just use it everywhere. Aromatics, A, onions and garlics. 
flavor foods. Allium veggies, um, so our onion, garlic, shallots, chives, scallions, and leeks. We need to be doing more of the scallions and the leeks and the shallots. Um, I put onion and garlic in virtually everything I cook, but recently I realized that there's a lot more flavor in shallots than onions. So um, they're very nutrient packed. There's 24 different flavonoid phytochemicals, um, which is anti-inflammatory and helps protect against cancer. They are antibacterial, fungal, parasitic, and antiviral. Um, so again, you may have heard, I know I mentioned it earlier on our um, Facebook group, but you may have heard in the olden days, they used to cut an onion and leave it by their kid's bedside table when they um, were sick to help um, draw out some of that sickness. Um, so he actually recommends that we chop and then stop with these veggies. Um, so what I, that's another takeaway that I've um, immediately implemented is I chop my onion very first thing and then I start to prep all the other stuff. Um, if we wait about 10 minutes, it increases the um, beneficial properties of these foods. All right, legumes, we talked quite a bit of those. Um, I shared the lentil effect study a couple days ago on, the, um, on our Facebook group. I just think it's so awesome, all the things that legumes can do for our blood sugar, our cholesterol, et cetera. Um, but also soybeans, peanuts, and peas are also legumes. And then there's sulforaphane, I'm sorry, sulforaphane veggies are broccoli, kale, arugula, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels. There's actually 40 cruciferous vegetables. And when we chew these vegetables, we actually break membranes in the plant and that separates chemicals. It sounds like sci-fi. Like sci it separates chemicals in the plant and sets off a reaction that leads to the production of ITCs, which are beneficial. And that's our cancer curing, inflammation fighting, heart healthy, blood sugar minimizing, fat burning, all the good stuff. And then just a bonus, he encourages mushrooms and seaweed. Um, mushrooms can protect against breast cancer. Um, look up Wicked Healthy if you're a big mushroom fan. They do tons of mushroom focused meals. And then um, seaweed promotes weight loss and then it's an excellent source of iodine and B12. I have been using ever since we first switched our diet kombu in all of my um, cooked grains and beans. You don't taste it, you just put it in there and it helps kind of take away some of the gas producing properties of those, um, those grains. All right, very quickly, lastly, lifestyle. Um, so he covers a ton of general lifestyle stuff that can help affect um, our gut health. But, you know, specifically he mentioned sleep, minute, uh, limit electronics before bed, get in nature, exposure to dirt in the outdoors is great for our guts. Let your kids play in the mud. I didn't need some um, recommendation to do that because my kids already do it, but it makes me feel a lot better as a mom. I can just be like, I'm just boosting their gut health, you know. Exercise, short chain fatty acid producing microbes are generated through exercise. The recommendation is 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week. I encourage a little more if you can do it, just make it a routine, add it to your lifestyle, park farther away. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not a big gym membership person, although I was given a free treadmill, like post on Facebook and see if somebody has one sitting in their garage, they'll give you. Um, but I'm just a huge proponent of just getting outside and, and letting the exercise kind of happen naturally. Um, my husband is one that has to sit at the desk for um, 40 plus hours a week. And so we bought him a standing desk so that he can stand. Um, and so he's just got triggers in his daily schedule to encourage him to stand up and kind of walk around with his headset on while he's talking to his clients. Time restricted eating. I took this one away too. He recommends that we give our guts about 13 hours rest between meals. Um, and he doesn't want you to go to bed at midnight and stop eating at 11.59 and then not eat until 1 p.m. the next day. He really wants you to stop eating a couple hours before bed and then stop using your, you know, digital um, electronics before, you know, you go to sleep as well. Um, but to really let your gut rest and... Um, and then hydrating, starting your morning with water. That's another thing that I've kind of taken um, taken into my own personal routine is that I have a giant thing of water that I bring to bed every single night. I sip on it throughout the night. I'm pregnant, I'm up all night. And then in the morning, I finish it off before I take my first sip of coffee. Um, alcohol, he doesn't recommend for gut health, but there are some benefits to other areas of your um, health it, for the occasional glass of red wine if you're gonna have alcohol. So, whew, 
40 minutes. All right, y'all. I was determined to get it a little bit more accessible to you guys. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to take all of this and create a an audible, um, a digital audio uh, clip of some sort. One day I'd love to have a podcast, but until then, I know a lot of you guys are a lot more likely to listen to um, some of these nuggets of wisdom from Dr. B if I can put it into um, some sort of um, audio clip for you to listen to in your car, in your drive, on your way to work, or wherever you're going, doing your chores around the house. Um, I hope this was valuable to you. If you got any benefits um, just from what I shared with you, I guarantee you, you will take so much more away if you're able to actually dive in and read um, his information. I would be more than happy to share my notes with you guys if you want to dive in just a little bit more but don't have time to read the book. Um, if you have read the book, share with me your big takeaways. What have you implemented in your uh, lifestyle since reading the book? And any questions, let me know. I'd love to discuss. Um, again, follow Dr. B on um, social media. He's the Gut Health MD. And listen, starting today, let's increase our diversity of plants um, and just try to get fiber fueled. I just had no idea the, the number of things um, in my health that were related to the gut. And I think most people don't. It's new, right? So... All right, you guys, I hope this was helpful. I'm so excited. We're going to kick off a new month. Um, February is going to be Heart Health Month, so we're going to tackle a whole new book next month. So join me then. All right, have a great evening. Bye-bye.